In God's excellent word. I figured there was no harm in it, and I kept listening. They went on, all my hope on God was found in me. Who does still my trust renew? And later, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I didn't know the songs, but I liked them. I made my rounds a little later than usual that night, wondering to myself, how can they sing in prison? How can they pray after getting like, a beating like that from some out of control crowd? It didn't add up for me. I turned it over and over and I just couldn't see what was giving them that, that power. As it turned out, their power was much stronger than any irons I might have to clap on those men. In the middle of the night that night, I woke up from my sleep and I could tell that something had happened. The air felt different. I went to light a lamp, it wasn't on the table. I finally found it and I got it lit, and our beds were moved. The table, our door was hanging open. It must have been the earthquake that woke me, I thought. I grabbed my sword and I ran out to the jail, and the door was hanging open. The inmates were gone, so many prisoners lost, and I knew I was going to catch hell for losing those two foreigners. If they were all gone, then it would be a trial and a hanging for me and shame for my family, shame for my failure. I reached for my sword to take the honorable way out. But then I heard a voice. Don't hurt yourself. We are all still here. At first I didn't know who could possibly be saying that. I called for one of the boys to get a torch and we went into the jail. All the doors were open. All the shackles were off the prisoners. But they were sitting in a circle. Not one of them had run. And when I saw the two men still sitting, and knowing that they could very well have chosen to die just now so that I could stay alive, that staying in the prison could mean more trouble with a mob or facing down a strict magistrate, but that they stayed for my sake, for the sake of the very man who put them in the heaviest chains he had just hours before. Well, I had to know what they had. Why did they do that for me? And what do they know? What do they have? And can I get it too? I said, sirs, what must I do to say? And that was the start of my new life. Paul and Silas told me their story of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. I heard about Paul's turnaround from prosecutor to apostle, and I didn't want to wait. That night we got baptized, my whole household, and stayed up all night talking and eating together and celebrating. I didn't care if I lost my post at the jail. This is new life we're talking about here. It was worth a party. It was worth feeding those men who saved my life in more ways than one. And if that weren't the best part, in the morning, those magistrates came around with what they thought of as good news. Oh, you can go now, prisoners. It's time to leave town. Let's go. They tried to shoot Paul and Silas off. But Paul turned around and said, now, wait a minute. You can't treat Roman citizens like this and get away with it. When they heard that, those magistrates went about as white as two sheets hanging on a clothesline. It was all I could do to not bust out laughing right there. The magistrates were a lot nicer after that, and Paul took his sweet time leaving town. I went with him to Lydia's house. She's the host for our gathering here in Philippi. After that, Paul and Silas did say their goodbyes, and I was sad to see them go. But I know and I trust and I remember that I will see them again. And every week, on the first day of the week, at Lydia's house, we eat the bread that is Jesus' body, and we drink the cup that is his blood, and we remember the promise of new life in his resurrection. Thanks be to the Most High God, Creator, Redeemer, and indwelling Spirit.